Hi everyone. In the previous videos, I explained that in the late 19th century, German mathematicians Cantor and Dedekind defined a new number system consisting of rational and irrational numbers. In this new system, rational and irrational numbers were newly defined or given a new identity in such a way that they together became an arithmetic continuum corresponding to the fantasy geometric continuum. This new system is called the real number system, or the system of real numbers, and the newly defined rational and irrational numbers are called real numbers. According to the definition of the real numbers, each real number, whether it is a rational number or an irrational number, is defined as a collection of infinitely many entities, and one of the ways to express them is, as you can see, infinitesimal representations. However, a collection of infinitely many entities is a complete fantasy because it literally involves infinity, which has no counterpart in reality. You could only find these kind of things in some fantasy worlds such as Santa and his reindeer. Considering this, these kinds of objects that involve infinity should have been called imaginary numbers or fictional numbers but interestingly enough, they are rather called real numbers. Why is that? Since the answer to this question will help us understand why our modern mathematics is a religion, I'm going to explain this in detail in this video. So let's begin. First off, I point out that infinity is not something that you can achieve in reality, but it is a transcendental concept. Therefore, most of the time, pursuing infinity is related to religion. More specifically, in history, there were numerous religious groups seeking infinity. In many cases, infinity is an important attribute of their gods. One of the prominent groups is Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah. And in Kabbalah, they seek their god, Ein Sof, the meaning of which is infinity. However, you don't even have to go into trouble to look at other religious groups to find the link between religion and infinity. It is in the realm of mathematics that there was a strong linkage between a certain religious belief and infinity. The most vivid example is the German mathematician Gero Cantor, one of the mathematicians who defined the real number as a collection of infinitely many entities. When he advocated actual infinity in mathematics in the late 19th century, a significant portion of his arguments came out of his strong religious belief. After him, actual infinity became a legitimate notion in mathematics, and now it is one of the pillars of modern mathematics. Because Cantor's case alone shows why our modern mathematics is a religion, I'm going to deal with his case separately in a different video. Considering all this, calling these kinds of objects that involve infinity real numbers is never coincidental but is rather a manifestation of some kind of religious belief. More specifically, as I said in the first video, a deep and fundamental religious belief underlies our modern mathematics. Then, my question is that, what kind of religious belief is that? In order to figure it out, it is best to investigate how these objects that involve infinity came to be called real numbers. As you already know, these objects that involve infinity are just a new definition or the new identity of rational and irrational numbers, and the term real numbers was used by Cantor and Dedekind to refer to these newly defined rational and irrational numbers. But interestingly, even before the late 19th century, when rational and irrational numbers were defined in this new way and called real numbers, both kinds of numbers were already considered real by many prominent mathematicians. I'm going to introduce you to some of their remarks. First, let's look at what French mathematician Cauchy said in the early 19th century. You can notice that in this remark, he referred to rational and irrational numbers 
as real quantities or real values. If you go back in time a little more, you can also find the word real was being used to refer to rational and irrational numbers in the writings of 17th and 18th century mathematicians Euler, Leibniz, and Newton. Euler referred to rational and irrational numbers as real numbers or real. Leibniz also referred to them as real root, real one, real quantity. In the case of Newton, he says real, real root. And it dates all the way back to the 17th century philosopher and mathematician Descartes. Actually, he is the one who started this tradition of using the word real to refer to rational and irrational numbers. More precisely, he referred to rational and irrational roots of an equation as real roots in his book titled Geometry. It is worth looking at his remark closely, so let's look at what he said. Neither the true nor the false roots are always real. Sometimes they are imaginary. While we can always conceive of as many roots as I have already assigned, yet there is not always a definite quantity corresponding to each root so conceived of. Thus, while we may conceive of the equation x cubed minus 6x squared plus 13x minus 10 equals 0 as having three roots, yet there is only one real root, 2, while the other two remain always imaginary. Here, by true root, he means positive root, while by false root, he means negative root. So, true and false root collectively mean all positive and negative rational and irrational roots. Therefore, he means if an equation has rational or irrational roots, the roots are real, but otherwise they are imaginary. Also, he believed that an equation has as many roots as its degree. For example, a cubic equation must have three roots. However, the cubic equation he came up with has only one rational or irrational root, which is two actually. So, he referred to it as real, but the other two roots, which are not rational nor irrational roots, he referred to them as imaginary. The important thing is that here, he used the words real and imaginary in the literal sense of the words. He didn't use them just unknowingly. With this, the Israeli philosopher of mathematics Leo Corey says the following. Under the marked influence of this text, terms like imaginary and real were sweepingly adopted by mathematicians of the following generations. As I just showed you, Newton, Leibniz, Euler, and Cosi, they all used the word real in the same manner as Descartes did. Also, all of them except Newton used the word imaginary too. As for Newton, he used the word impossible instead of imaginary. So we know that all of them already refer to rational and irrational numbers as real in the literal sense of the word. Then, in particular, why did they consider irrational numbers real, not imaginary? As I said in the second video titled, How Did Irrational Numbers Originate? Irrational numbers were only able to be justified by geometry. For example, every irrational number is represented by the length of a line segment. Also, on the number line, every individual point corresponds to a rational or an irrational number. As you have seen in the third video, however, all this is possible because the geometric figures are invisible figures, and more fundamentally, they consist of sizeless points, which are actually contradictory and fictional objects. Therefore, the geometric figures consisting of sizeless points are fictional, and irrational numbers which are only able to be justified by fictional geometric figures, are also fictional concepts. So they should have been considered imaginary and fictional too. Were the mathematicians by any chance unaware of this fictional character of geometry and geometric figures? Of course not. 
since Euclid clearly stated in his monumental book called Euclid's Elements that a point is that which has no parts and a line is breadth length, they were definitely aware of that. Rather, since they strongly believed that geometry is a body of truth and these kinds of fictional and invisible geometric figures are real, or rather perfect, they unhesitatingly refer to irrational numbers as real quantities, real values, etc. For example, Descartes said in his book titled Rules for the Direction of the Mind, But now, let us proceed to explain more carefully our reason for saying, as we did a little while ago, that of all the sciences known as yet, arithmetic and geometry alone are free from any taint of falsity or uncertainty. Then, this leads us to the following question. Where did this kind of religious belief in geometry come from? As you might remember, this belief didn't come into existence suddenly, but was inherited from a far past, which is ancient Greece. Also, you could remember that it originated from Plato and his group. Therefore, by looking into what they thought of geometry or mathematics, we can find out what kind of specific religious belief has been passed down throughout history and underlies our modern mathematics. So in the next video, we'll go back in time to ancient Greece and look into their idea about mathematics. So, please look forward to it and thank you for watching today's video.